How's everybody doing this fine day? Good. I, uh, I was kind enough to give everyone a break um, on our Revelation series for Mother's Day. Uh, no such break will be given today. Uh, just like our Father, we're going to make us do something we don't want to do, but we'll do it together, and it's going to be great. <clears throat> so, all right, so we're going to continue. Uh, in a little bit, here. we'll be in Revelations chapter 13, but um, I did come across some, some news recently that I wanted to share with you guys. I, I recently found out uh, that they're not making uh, rulers any longer. Uh, they're still just going to be a foot. Um, so if you guys want to think. Uh, uh, you're okay, welcome. So you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. That was for you. Uh, Feel free to use that whenever you like. It was intentionally terrible. I hope you all enjoyed it. So, uh, as we continue our journey, I was thinking about you know Father's Day and certainly you know all of the aspects and traditions and the, really the, the the thought of it is really a beautiful time to pause and just be so glad for our dads and not everyone has a good relationship with their dads, and so I'm, I'm sensitive to that, too. I know that uh, not, everyone, not everyone's experience is the same, right? And some people have a, uh, they haven't spoke to their father, or some people have lost their father, and so there's a lot of things to think about in Father's Day, but uh, I wanted to share something with you guys that I was thinking about when I was younger. Uh, my dad had in his mind to take us to Disney World, and my dad is the most type A person in the world, and so we, uh, he had got the, and this is before Burn Bombs was the official guide, he got this book, this giant paperback book, the Burn Bombs Unofficial Guide to Disney, and he pulls this thing out, and we read it as a family for, <laughs> for weeks, and it was a lot of mental anguish preparation for going to Disney, and so we thought to ourselves, man, this is good, this is a work trip, this is, this is not going to be, this is not going to be a good time, but we are we were wrong. So we were up every morning around 5 a.m. in Disney, uh, maybe 5:30 if we were, you know, if we were, you know, if we were good that day. And so we got up bright and early, went down to the, you know, the food court, got our food, and we were the first bus out, first person through the gate. And for eight days, we <laughs> we traversed. And I'm pretty sure we saw all of Disney World in eight days. Uh, no, I think we only scratched the surface, but we, you know, we had a hopper pass, and so we went to each kingdom for two days and so we would start today okay guys here's the plan when you get the beauty and the beast exhibit at this time this show is going time we got to get the tarzan rocks at this time and all these events right and it was it was aggressive and so um I, but looking back you know you know you think as a kid you're like well this is so exhausting but we got to see more than did more disney than most people probably seen in a lifetime because of just how he approached it and i'm super grateful uh, for his very practical very methodical, very aggressive um, gift to us. And I am forever grateful because I look back in that time so favorably. And it was really something that I'm, I'm grateful we got to do as a family because I know that everyone has a chance to go there. And so I knew that it was that great personal sacrifice to, to make that happen for us. And so we were just so glad. And I'll never forget those 22-hour car rides in the car. Good times, right? And I'm pretty sure my dad went straight through. I don't think he slept. I don't know how he did it. Yeah, so different times, but I think about that, and I think about how, you know, that was my earthly father, right, just planning ahead, thinking about all the things that we're going to come across, making sure that we are able to get the best experiences possible, right, I think about our Heavenly Father, what does He do, He plans ahead, tries to make sure we have the most positive experiences possible, now sometimes that means going through some discomfort, right, going through some things that maybe, ah, maybe aren't so great, right, but it's for our ultimate good as we work through those things, and so, um, certainly, you know, Revelations is a picture of a Heavenly Father who is looking out for us and saying, hey, here is what's going to happen. You probably don't want to be around for a lot of this stuff, um, so you might want to get yourself uh, right before the Lord before these activities take place. But we do have a picture of how it ends, and so this is where we'll continue. And so uh, we'll read chapter 13 in just a minute, but just as a quick recap to bring everybody up to speed who's been following along this an equally aggressive journey, is we have just a quick run-through of a summary to catch up in case you missed the first 12 chapters of Revelation so far. <laughs> we'll go quick. So we have the prologue, letters to the seven churches, right? Chapters 1 and 3, John receives a vision of Jesus Christ and is instructed to write letters to the seven churches addressing the spiritual state, commendations, warnings, and promises. It goes on to chapter 4, which is the heavenly throne vision. John is taken to a spirit in heaven. Sees God's throne surrounded by the elders, living creatures, symbolizing God's majesty and eternal reign. 
Chapter 5 goes into the scroll and the Lamb. Scroll with seven seals is presented. Only the Lamb, Jesus, who is worthy, can open it, signifying the unfolding of God's redemptive plan. <gasps> We're carrying on. <laughs> We're opening the seals. Chapter 6 through 7, the Lamb opens the first six seals, un unleashing a series of horrible judgments, by the way, upon the earth while the faithful are marked for protection. The seven seals then open, chapters 8 through 9. Seven seal introduces seven trumpet judgments, bringing further calamities, yet many people remain unrepentant. Not a good time to not be acknowledging God. The mighty angel and the two witnesses, chapters 10 and 11. We have a mighty angel who gives John a little scroll to eat, symbolizing the bittersweet nature of prophecy. Remember, it was sweet on the mouth, bitter on the tummy. Um, the two witnesses prophesy are killed, resurrected, representing the church's witness to, and God's power to preserve. And lastly, last week, we took a look at conflict in heaven and earth, chapter 12. A woman clothed in the sun gives birth, opposed by a dragon, Satan. Just, you know, I'd like to make it real clear here. Uh, after a heavenly battle, the dragon is cast on earth, signifying ongoing spiritual warfare. So if you missed the first couple, that's where we're at. So this is just a quick summary for you guys. I did that to just uh, <clears throat> give you some nice encouraging things to think about for this morning. All right, so chapter 13, we are going to read it together as a church, and uh, we'll unpack it the best that we're able in the time that we have. Um, it should only take a couple hours, so we should be here um, out of here by dinner time. So uh, chapter 13. Uh, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns. And each head had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. Interesting creature. Uh, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he was, he was given authority to the beast. It also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Quick math, that's three and a half years. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. He was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All the names who had not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain in the creation of the world. He, he who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, uh, with the sword he will be killed. Very encouraging stuff for Sunday morning, I know. Uh, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Uh, the second half of the chapter here, when I saw another beast coming out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. I don't know how dragons speak, but this is how he spoke. He exercised all authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of man. Because of the signs, he was given the power to, to do on behalf of the first beast. He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given the power to give breath to the image of the first beast. This is super complicated. I know we're, we're almost there, guys. So that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast and the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the man's number. His number is 666. Six. How about that for our morning recap, huh? All right, so that's chapter 13. So we're going to jump through and try to the best of our ability, give an account of what's taking place, right? So we know that we're in the midst of this great tribulation. We have this ruler who has taken a foot here, and we're learning about his characteristics. Uh, not a good creature, right? Certainly everything that opposes God uh, in a very proud and blasphemous way. And doing so in the face of um, anyone and everyone who will listen to him, right? So verses 1 through 10 are really trying to give us a picture of um, a beast that rises from the sea, seven heads, ten horns, symbolizing great power and blasphemy against God, right? So 13.1, it's just, it's the unveiling of conditions on the earth at the end of an age. The following factors will be manifest. One, uh, the world ruler is satanically energized, not good. He and his image are worshipped, also not good, right? He's acknowledged as possessing supreme military power. He exercises universal authority and he persecutes the believers in Christ. And the second beast is a deceiver and he exercises economic dictatorship. For those of you who are wondering, 
We're doing Revelations as a reminder, because my beloved daughter said, can you do a stand in Revelations? So you have heard a thing <laughs> for our 95 week series on Revelations. And I'm so glad you did. It's great. <clears throat> so Daniel's fourth beast in the book of Daniel, recall our friend Daniel, right? Daniel and the... The, the trout? Daniel and the what? That's the one. Lion's Den. Thank you, Miss Allen. Daniel and the Lion's Den. Right. So Daniel, that guy. There was a vision in, in Daniel 7, 24, and it says that the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he will subdue the three kings. Right. So we have this continuation of this prophetic narrative from the book of Daniel. Right. So we know that another one will rise. This whole vision is the last form of Gentile world power, a confederation, if you will, of ten nations, which will be a revival of the old Roman Empire. Not necessarily in political uh, socio uh, implications, but it'll be a, a resurgence or a renaissance of the Roman Empire. Uh, its fear will probably reach out beyond the old boundaries, since it's to be a world power. Right? We read again in Daniel 7, 4, and 6 here. Where he says that the first was like a lion, had the wings of an eagle, which which washed until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, super creepy, and the mind of a human being was given to it. And there before me we got it, stood a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, and it was such a weird vision, right? After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. Let's walk through those wonderful creatures, shall we? So a lion, quite simply, represents Babylon's veracity. Think about lions, you're not thinking about someone who's having a quinoa salad, right? What are they doing? They're out in the wilderness, they're hunting, they're voracious, they're aggressive, and the Babylonians were all of those things, right? We have the next kingdom which would come, which would be the Persians, and they were known for their tenacity. They were very stubborn. They were very um, forthright in how they carried out their activities. And then ultimately the Macedonians were swift. That's how they ultimately took over the Persians. And that's where we have the, the lion, bear, and the leopard. You're thinking of the lion, the witch, the war, but not like that. Sort of similar, but not really. So lion, bear, and leopard, we have the, we have the Persians, the uh, Macedonians, and the lion. So Verse 13 3, it says, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, right? This is actually a picture of a fragment of the ancient Roman Empire, which had never ceased to exist as separate kingdoms. It was the imperial form of government. So it's the form of government itself, of imperialism, which ceased. The one head had a fatal wound, so not a lot of imperialism these days. However, uh, written prophetically as a restoration of imperial form, as, as, as though um, over a federated empire of ten kingdoms, the head is healed, restored, and there is an emperor again, uh, the beast, right? So this resurrection, this resurgence is just the recovery of a very ancient and very aggressive and not so nice form of government, uh, which was um, categorical imperialism in that space. And so certainly, you hear this language, and you're thinking to yourself, this sounds an awful lot like Star Wars, right? That's, the, well, where did they got the language from, right? Imperialism, we have the, the Federation, the Empire, right? All these things, these are all, uh, you know, we as humans are drawn to these huge, over-the-top, inexplainable narratives because it's part of how we are fabricated. It's how we've been created here, and I just love that. So carrying on, in the second half of verses 11, through 18, right? So we've got through what's happening, who those uh, who those empires, who those kingdoms represented, and then we have another beast. Verses 11 through 8 picks up and talks about this other beast. Not so, not so great, right? So in 13, 11 we see that I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon, right? So many identify this beast. Is coming out of the earth as the Antichrist, right? You might hear that phrase as, oh, this must be the Antichrist. You're right, it is. Uh, however, uh, according to scriptures, many Antichrists and those who have the spirit of the Antichrist proceed and prepare the way for the final Antichrist. You might be thinking of, I don't know of a John the Baptist equivalent for the Antichrist, right? But what you have is a cog of culture and the mechanism of these mistruths that have infiltrated, that have permeated, 
that have been um, pervasive in modern day culture, right? So these antichrists, so the anti-God movement, this anti, I don't need God, or I want to live my truth, live my best self, right? All of these little uh, colloquialisms that uh, serve to dilute the power of God keep us distracted from God, right? And so uh, these antichrists, as we know them today, are the uh, smaller known forms, or the, really the laying the groundwork of the, the world culture that we would ultimately find ourselves in in the final days, right? So we see this, though, throughout Scripture here. We see that really that there's two things, right? Uh, there is a spirit of the Antichrist, right? And then there is a supreme mark of Antichrist, which is denial of the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, who is... We'll try it again. Yeah. We'll, we'll try it again. We're ready. Okay, you guys are ready. Okay. <laughs> you ready? So, the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, who is? Jesus. You guys are so good. That was great. Good job. Everyone gets two points. Uh, so that was that's correct. So we see this in John, First John, rather, where he talks about antichrists and the antichrist spirit. He says, "Dear children, this is the last hour." And I love how God, you know, whenever you know Jesus is talking, He uses time. I think to just kind of mess with us, right? Because an hour to him, what is time? He's not bound by time, right? We think sixty minutes, you know, with, with Barbara Walters. No, we think sixty minutes is an hour, right? Well, the hour means this is the time, this is the era, this is the time frame in which these things take place. This is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So anytime we have a sect of religion that maybe uh, flirts with the idea of Christianity, but dilutes a little bit, introduces a new character that has a new prophecy, you know, in 1800, um, or there is a whole uh, tradition of religion that is categorically uh, disbelieving that Jesus is in, him, in and of himself actually God, they believe that he is a creation of God, and certainly is God-like, but is not the Lord, right? And so there's this this pervasive many uh, lies that are weaving their way in and out of culture, and it really caused to create confusion, caused to create doubt, and caused to create frustration uh, throughout our our following of Christ. And he also says this in First John four three. He says, "But every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is not from God." This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. And so some people will say, well, from God, yeah, he was created by God. No, 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 he is God, he's from himself. He is He is a eternal um, a trinity in and of himself. So he's always operating since the beginning of time, and way before that, right? He's always been there, so there's not this new character on the scene. Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all three distinct persons in one, and any, um, any any denial of that is an antichrist type of thinking. So it's important that we as Christians have a right understanding of what that means, and that we have the ability to communicate that to others. So um, carrying on, though, we see that this beast, carrying back to this 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 antichrist character, exercises the same power as the first beast, deceiving people into worshiping the first beast and its image. And the second beast enforces the mark of the beast, 666, on humanity, right? Controlling, which really co controls uh, commerce, loyalty, services. Don't think of it as if I don't have this mark of 666, I can't go to Aldi. Uh, it's much deeper than that. There is this there is this rejection of human services that will be given to you if you don't have this mark. So if you are living on the fringe and you have refused to adopt this symbol, and, and, and either on your forehead or on your right hand, uh, this would be, uh, this would prevent you from really existing a healthy and full life because you can't access anything. You can't access health care, you can't access uh, banking, you can't access anything because you have um, later learned after, we'll say after the rapture, you've later learned about the truth of Jesus and you're now a believer and now you're just buying your time until either you die or he returns and you have this, this, this period of time where you're waiting as a uh, as, a, as a convert of Christianity after the church has exited the building, the building being earth. So, 
Uh, the interesting thing about the mark of the beast, we hear it all the time, like, when I was little, you'd calculate something on your calculator, and it ended up being 666, you're like, oh no, my calculator's cursed, right? And you would say, maybe that would just be. Uh, but in any event, so you'd see this number, or you, you go to a grocery store, I've seen people do this, you go to the grocery store, and there are groceries, bring up 666 and all they're buying is like you know um one q-tip nowadays right so um so they bought you know, so it's 666 and they're like oh no so they'll buy a stick of gum just to get rid of that number and i've seen this happen in real time they're like well i can't have that in a row uh, i want these tic tacs and they're like they don't want it so now now they have to have a life of tic tacs because of their their fear of that number and really uh, something that's interesting about this number, and the reason it's called the mark of man, is it represents imperfection. When did, when did God create man? On the sixth day, right? I, was, I gave you that one. So on the sixth day. So we see this. There's a wonderful quote here I want to share with you guys. and It's a wonderful, gives us a picture of why it is the, the, the number of man, right? Since man was created on the sixth day, six is the number of man, creation was made for man, and likewise has the number six stamped on it. 24 hours in a day, 4 by 6, 12 months a year, 2 by 6. 7 is the number of perfection and fullness, but 6 is the human number, and just short of perfection. From our dear friend Warren Wearsby. You're thinking, I hope you hear from Warren Wearsby this morning, and you got to. He was a uh, minister in 1957, so if you're hoping to time travel, we just did. So there we have it. So this is a nice way to symbolize and understand and help me help categorize. Like, what is 6? How is that the number of man, right? And this is where this comes from. And so there's all sorts of numerologists who will spend their entire life devoted to trying to uh, apply calculus to the Bible to figure out the exact moment, second, and activity when God is coming, right? Well, we know, you know, Jesus was pretty clear that no man knows the day or the hour he's going to return. And so we, we, we know we can't solve for it. There's no uh, whiteboard big enough to be able to solve this calculus here. But certainly the numbers have meaning, but they're not the meaning. They're just signs of and uh, symbols of things that are uh, to be on the lookout. So or some people might look at 666 as, um, as something to do with King Solomon. And I was always weirded out by this when I read this number. Oh, did, I, did I not include it? I did not include it. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you. So First Kings, First Kings, whew, a lot of words, guys. We're almost done. We're doing great. First Kings 1014 says that the weight of gold that Solomon received yearly was 600 66 talents. Perhaps this suggests that, like the Antichrist, like Solomon, uh, might be a good man who becomes corrupted. So a lot of people think that this person, this Antichrist, is like born a dragon and is walking around as a dragon until his time comes. Well, uh, it's more likely that it's a person who might even have good intentions, but is corrupted by the enemy, right? So this is a person who is able to uh, amass great popularity, great uh, fellowship, and great allegiance, and so everyone is just blindly following this person, and they're not using uh, truth to guide their principles, and they are now fully uh, invested in this person. Now, I know this never happens in our political system, <laughs> but if it did, that's something to look for. Are we following a person who's in the White House, or a person who's trying to get into the White House, or are we following God, right, who's created everything? And so we as Christians need to make sure that we're aware of the world around us, but we can't be... Uh, so uh, overwhelmed by it that we're incapable of operating in the space that the Lord has given us during this time. And so I, I think about that. So uh, you can muse, you know, indefinitely about who the Antichrist might be. There has been many who have come and gone who have been said, well, that's the Antichrist. I was like, well, if they were, they, we'd be at the end by now, right? And so um, it's important that we as Christians, a couple things, we don't fear that number. It's just an allegory. It's just a number about humanity, right? So if you see the number, don't buy the Tic Tacs, unless you really want the Tic Tacs, then get the Tic Tacs. But the point is, don't let that be uh, your guiding principle. And don't let that be the, the main focus here. Um, so there's no superstition behind it. It's just a number, right? Um, but it is interesting to see how God uses uh, that number. So one thing to look at and think about, and I often wonder, is like, I don't know if it's going to be an actual number. So I've my mind goes places, right? So I began to think as a young man. I was like, I wonder what you know what the symbol is going to be. Is everyone going to get a tattoo? You know, you think about you know Holocaust survivors. They all had tattoos, and there was it was a number marking them as part of the inventory, right? So you think about is there going to be a tattoo? Is there going to be some sort of a symbol? And so now in modern times, we all have we all have phones for the most part, right? Most adults are like, well, I don't know if it'll be a phone because everybody has a phone. So then I thought, okay. 
I know that scientifically, and in the uh, kind of on the fringe, uh, not so fringe, but we'll call it fringe for now, on the fringe uh, study of science, there is something called an RFID implant, right? So an RFID implant is a little bitty chip that can go into your hand or your head by way of injection. And this little chip is just a transponder, but it contains potentially personal information about you. Anyone ever use their phone to pay for something at the grocery store? Like ever use Google Pay or what's the other uh, main system? I forget. Yeah, That's the one. Yeah, I won't say it. So the other one, uh, the, the, the Macintosh system. Um, and so Google Pay or Apple Pay, right? it's all these systems, right? And you think, it's like maybe, maybe that's a thing. So I want to just walk through, if you can, I want you to see a couple examples of our RFIDs have been used. So this is kind of smart to read, so I'm going to read it for you. So we have four categories of how RFID implants are already being used in experimental ways, and some not so experimental. Uh, an RFID chip can be used to make contactless payments. For example, a security guard from the Netherlands has an implant that allows him to pay simply by placing his hand near a payment reader. Boop. Not, not weird at all, right? Uh, medical information, right? RFID chips can store medical records, identification, providing quick access to medical history, and facilitating patient management, which sounds wonderful, right? Can you imagine going into a hospital, you have no documentation, you have no history, you have no insurance, you have no identification, you're off the street, they can just scan your, your hand like you're a puppy that got found at a vet's office, and they scan your chip, right? Who got chip? Everyone chip their dogs, got chip their dogs. All right, so you have this chip, they scan it, they immediately understand uh, what you have access to. They know that you have a payment history, they know that you had, you know, um, you know, you had a, a leg removed two years ago, right? Or you, you know, you'd probably be able to see that if that happened. Uh, but there'd be other markers, maybe you're diabetic, maybe you have allergies, right? So you're thinking all these things, like, oh, this is really cool. What a great tool to access services, right? Or you think about access control, right? Chips are used to secure, uh, for secure entry into buildings, workstations, and other secured areas. That'd be nice if you know you walk into work, you know, oh, I forgot my badge, what do I do? Just scan your hand, right? So convenient, right? Um, and so there's there's other ways uh, that can be used. Also, uh, personal use, right? So some people have implanted RFID chips for personal reasons, such as carrying a link to their last will and testament, mm -hmm. right? Wild, right? <laughs> scan someone's hand, get a PDF on your on your on your phone. <laughs> We live in weird times, people. I don't tell you that to scare you. I'm just telling you that all these things that probably seem relatively impossible and difficult to comprehend, like how could one world system possibly have a number? Like no one has that much ink. That's a lot of tattooing, right? Or uh, RFID chips, uh, or things like that. I'm not saying that if you get, if you see an RFID chip, right, you now have the mark of the beast. All of your all of your keys. If you have if you have a key that opens remotely, your car. You have an RFID chip, so don't freak out. You're going to be fine. It's just a it's just a mechanism. It's just a technology. It's amoral. It means nothing. But I just wanted to introduce you to the idea that the end is near. <laughs> Not to scare you, just to give you information, right? And so it's important that we are just aware of the world that we live in and the things that are around us, right? So you know, really, to, to summarize this chapter, uh, does a bit for us here. I just want to give you a quick rundown of chapter 13, in case you didn't hear my 50,000 words a second. Uh, this is the rundown, okay? So we have the beast is from the sea, describes a beast with seven heads, ten hordes, symbolizing political powers and governments that oppose to God. The beast's authority, right? The beast is given power and authority by the dragon, Satan, leading to widespread worship and control over many nations. And this will be this will have the picture of world peace, by the way. This will look like world peace. Can you imagine there is a consortium of every single nation on earth that was on the same page about one topic? Think about that. World peace, right? So it has the appearance, it has the facade of peace. The beast from the earth introduces the second beast representing religious deception. So initially there is this rise to kind of political power, then it converts into this this, this religious activity, right? Uh, worship of the first beast and perform signs to deceive the mark of the beast, right? Introduces the infamous mark of the beast required for buying, selling, symbolizing allegiance to anti-Christ, anti-Christian powers. And lastly, as Christians, during this time, and certainly during that time, those would probably be the uh, Messianic uh, Jews or those who maybe never heard about God and maybe there was someone who was left behind and they're like, oops, I had all this information and I forgot to believe it. So they're now, you know, sharing that information with others. So they're now new believers during this time of tribulation. There's a call for endurance, right? Encourages believers to remain faithful 
and endure persecution, emphasizing the need uh, for wisdom and discernment. And so I, I say that to say this, as we as a church continue to journey through and think about Revelation and how it applies to how I'm going to you know, go shopping tomorrow, uh, you're, you're going to think about RFID chips forever now, I'm sorry about that. So as you go through your day to day, and you go through your life, Revelation is a, is a super important book because it gives us a sensitivity to both the urgency and the outcome of God's plan for us, right? It ends well for us, for those that believe. And so I just wanted to give you guys a quick heads up. The beast is pretty terrible. Uh, here's, a, here's a preview. In chapter 15, too, he does die, right? So I just want to let you know. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name and held harps given them by God. So now that they kill the beast, they play a song about it on my harps. So let's take all that this morning and let's close in prayer, guys. Father, we thank you so much for your, your word this morning and for your, your guidance for us as a church as we work through this important book. I pray that we would be people of discernment, and people of wisdom, people of compassion, that we would be sensitive to the world around us, that we would carry with us an urgency about the end time, that we would live in such a way that it reflected people who understood that the end is in this hour. We know that it's near. We don't know when. We don't know how exactly. But we do know that the outcome is clear. You are victorious. And those who stand with you, who stand firm in the faith, receive that victor's crown. So I pray that you help us to be people who are willing to put all of our faith, all of our hope, all of our desires in you. And I pray that you just help us as a people to re be reminded that when we see things in the world that seem hopeless, that seem impossible, that seem so frustrating, that seem so full of evil, that we're reminded that we are here but sojourners passing through. This is not our kingdom. We are we are aliens in this world. And I pray that you help us to be a positive light to all that we encounter. That when people ask us about what makes us different, we would have a firm and loving answer about the redeeming power of Christ. I pray that you help us to have that relationship with you and to, and to acknowledge before you that we know that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that 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 you have you have died and rose again, Lord. We know that we can be saved. So I pray you just help us to be people who are uh, on mission in that, Lord. That we would reach those around us. That you continue to help us to be discerning and full of, uh, full of kindness. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.